part two of Daniel 9, in a sense. We have two sessions on Daniel 9, the 70th week passage in the Bible. So just look at this as part two on Daniel 9. It's such an important chapter, not only for its own sake, in the sense of understanding Daniel, but it also is the keystone to unlock end-time prophecy. I've collected books on prophecy for 50 years, believe it or not, more than that. Uh, and uh, I, I quickly discover some of them are a little confused. And if they're, if they're confused about Daniel 9, they're confused about the rest. On the other hand, if the author has done his homework to understand the prophecies that we're looking at tonight, you'll discover that not everything, but almost everything, will fall into place in terms of apparent contradictions that other people can't resolve will become clear if you take Daniel 9 on, uh, on part of it and also be very precise in your use of terms. And uh, so in any case, it's a, it's a pivotal uh, underpinning, if you will, of, of a, a, any serious study of a Bible prophecy. So we are now in, we've, we've talked about verse 24 was the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 was this fantastic, fulfilled part of it to the very day, very instructive. Now we're going to encounter an interval. We'll discover that verse 27, the last verse of the chapter, deals with the 70th week, the Antichrist and all those things. But verse 26, as we examine it carefully, deals with things that occur after verse 25, but before verse 27. That sounds primitive. It sounds like I'm almost being facetious, but you need to come to terms with that yourself. Not because I told you. Study it and, and uh, understand it. Now here's verse 26. Remember now the context. He previously said there were seven weeks and three score and two weeks. We've really got three divisions. Seven, sixty-two, and one left. So when, I, when it says after three score and two, that's obviously after the seven. You have seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's what we talked about in verse uh, 25. But after the three score and two weeks, that confuses many people unless you just sketch it out. And uh, in other words, if, if I'm after the three score and two weeks means it's after both the seven and the three score and two. It's like saying after the 69 weeks, it's the same thing. After the three score and two weeks, shall the Mashiach be karat, shall the Messiah be cut off. Now the word karat is um, um, uh, uh, to be executed to be killed, to be cut off. He'll be, now, this, now, by the way, right there, it should astonish you. Here in the Old Testament, you have a prophecy that the Messiah is destined to be killed, to be executed for a capital crime, but not for himself. Who is he executed for? Us, Us right on, exactly. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And so the word karat, to cut off, to eliminate, to kill, to execute. We have another phrase that pops in here, the prince that shall come. Many people who read this superficially jump to the conclusion that the prince that shall come is the Messiah. Because indeed, the Messiah shall come. In fact, uh, uh, he has in verse 25, and of course he's going to come again at the climax of all of this. But the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. We have a, a 2020 hindsight opportunity here because we know what people destroyed the city and the sanctuary. What happened after Christ was crucified 38 years later? The Roman legions under Titus Vespasian set the siege and, and destroyed not only the city but and the sanctuary both. Um, so the people of the prince that shall come are obviously the Romans. The prince that shall come is the leader. Now it's interesting, the prince that shall come is a one of 33 titles of the final world ruler. Nimrod was the first, and this guy that's coming is the last one. And there are actually 33 titles in the Old Testament and 13 in the New. 
Unfortunately, we seem to have chosen one of those to be sort of a catch-all. We call him the Antichrist. And he is Antichrist, so that's, it's okay, except it's a little misleading. He is against Christ, but the word Antichristo in the Greek really means instead of Christ. But there are many other labels that are actually more descriptive. But any one of, the, one of the labels is the prince that shall come. This is a ruler that shall come. And we're going to see that he's going to be a major player in verse 27. The people of the prince that shall come are the Romans. So in that, this is one of several verses that causes us to understand that the prince that shall come or the Antichrist or call him what you will is from the Roman Empire. Because of that, many of us, me included, in my earlier materials, was myopic enough to conclude that if he's out of the Roman Empire, he must be out of Western Europe. There are many very competent Bible scholars that to this day still believe that. But I have to tell you candidly, I think that's a vict we're victims of myopia. When you and I think of the Roman Empire, we tend to think of Western Europe. That's because we ignore the eastern leg of that empire. It's so different, we give it a different name. We call it the Byzantine Empire, meaning in a, we use that term to refer to the, the eastern leg because the eastern leg of the Roman Empire outlived the western leg by a thousand years. Diocletian divided it into two parts. It got to, by the, 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 the empire, empire became so big, it became so big that he had dual rulers. When Constantine finally takes over, he is so fed up with the politics in Rome, he moves the capital of the Roman Empire, the capital of the world, to Byzantium. Renames it Constantinople, the new Rome. And uh, so uh, we, don't, we have a tendency in cultural terms to think of the Roman Empire and its Western Europe heritage. We tend to regard the eastern leg of the Roman Empire differently, but that's our labeling. And uh, we know from Isaiah 10 and Micah 5 and several other passages that one of the key titles of the Antichrist is the Assyrian. The Assyrian. And uh, we have materials on that you can explore to get at that more in more depth. But in any case, that's who we're talking about here. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood or maybe even a diaspora if you want. And under the end of the war, desolations are determined. Here's a little diagram that's important. It does not to scale, by the way. But we have verse 25, 26, and 27. Verse 24 was the scope of the whole thing. Verse 25 we took last time. The 69 weeks consisted of 7 plus 62, remember? That's why when I say after 62, I'm really saying after the 69. Do you follow me? That's not a contrivance. You just see it or you don't. Okay. The 70th week is yet, that's going to be dealt with in verse 27. So we're in verse 26 which deals with an interval between these two, during which the Messiah is karat, executed. That's not the triumphal entry. That was four, four days earlier. That was on the 10th of Nisan. When the, in, the, in the temple, they were examining the lambs for the Passover four days in advance. The Lamb of God was presenting himself for examination, riding that donkey in. Four days later, the crucifixion takes place. The city and the sanctuary are destroyed by the people of the prince that shall come. Now, we know that that happened in 70 AD. So we know this interval from the text alone has to include at least 38 years. But it's been, since we know that verse 27 hasn't started yet, I'm going to argue that this has lasted for uh, uh, over 1970 years, this interval. And uh, it, is, it may be coming to a conclusion within three decades for a number of reasons. So um, let's talk a little bit about this. It it's, might, might fascinate you to understand from rabbinical literature that verse 26 was recognized by the rabbis that it was messianic and it was prior to the temple being destroyed. The Messiah had to be executed before the temple was destroyed. If you're looking for a candidate for the Messiah of Israel, it should be somebody who was executed before the fall of Jerusalem 70 A.D., and we've got a great candidate to suggest to put forth here. 
but that's it in, 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 in the rabbinical writings, in Yalkut, volume 2, and so forth. Also, in Midrash Bereshit, the Messiah was to, to exit prior to 33 AD, and that was in the Warsaw edition. Again, drawing that same inference from the fall of Jerusalem, etc. So, and indeed he did, by the way. I'm indebted to Yaakov Prash for these insights. So now let's talk about the death. There's another thing you need to understand. We try to emphasize it up front. These four verses are aimed at Israel. Let's talk about Israel. It's the missing key of systematic theology. You know, if you go to any pastor's library or study, you'll find a set of uh, uh, books on theology. And there's usually a set called systematic theology or something equivalent. And all of them have pretty much the same table of contents. They may have different views about some things, but they all have the same this thing called bibliology. That's a study of the Bible. Theology proper, the attributes of God. Christology, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Pneumatology, which is their study of the Holy Spirit. Angeology, that's angels, both fallen and unfallen. Anthropology, study of man. Soteriology, salvation, ecclesiology, the church, and eschatology, which is a fancy word for study of last things or end time things. Those are typically the topics. And it comes as a shock to discover that there is a topic that constitutes five-sixths of the Bible that is not mentioned as a study in and of itself within the structure of most renderings of systematic theology. And that is Israelology, the study of Israel as God's instrument of his plan of redemption. It's scattered through some of these things, but focused on, it's astonishing to realize how many churches are totally obtuse to the role of Israel in the future. In fact, they embrace a concept that's called replacement theology. What that labels is the idea that because Israel rejected her Messiah, the promises that were uh, on Israel fall upon the church. And that's where churches replaced Israel is the concept. That happens to be an unfortunate heresy for several reasons. It causes a lot of confusion, but more than that, it tends to make God a liar. Because there are verse after verse after verse after verse throughout the Old and New Testament where God reaffirms his commitments to Israel, the nation Israel. And not the least of which is Gabriel's uh, 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 commitment to Mary, that her child would sit on David's throne. David's throne didn't exist back in those days. And uh, he has yet to do that. So Israel and the church, you want in your own study, not because I'm telling you this, I want you in your own study to come to your own conclusions and explore the possibility of distinctions between Israel and the church. They're different. They have different origins. They have different missions, actually, and certainly very different destinies. The replacement views that you sometimes hear in many, from many pulpits deny Israel's place in God's program. And one of the great tragedies in our own foreign policy is that our leadership, which on the one hand is God-fearing and, and, and professes Christ, has not exhibited, at least to my sensitivities, uh, a, an awareness of Israel's destiny in God's program. It, it creates some interesting issues. But one of the reasons this is such a sensitive topic is that you're embracing this tends to the unknowingly, and unfortunately, make God a liar. It also lays the basis for anti-Semitism. It was these views that led to the Holocaust in Europe. It wasn't just the Nazis, it was the silent pulpits that were anti-Semitic in, in their nature. And one of the rebuttals to this is Paul, in his definitive statement of Christian doctrine, we call the book of Romans, hammers away for three chapters, 9, 10, and 11 that God is not finished with Israel, they have a destiny. We need to understand what it is if we're going to make any sense out of God's plan of redemption. The 70-week prophecy specifically deals with Israel, not the church. Gabriel made that very clear right up front. And you notice in the New Testament period, the church period, Paul deals with three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 32 is an example of that. While the church, between Acts chapter 2, its birth, and the rapture, its regathering, during this period of time, the focus of God's program is on the church, which is neither Jew nor Gentile. Once the church is out of here, God is once again going to deal with the planet Earth 
Jew and Gentile, through Israel, the way he used to. And uh, that's what's so interesting about the book of Revelation, because from chapter 4, verse 1 on, you'll notice it's Jewishness. There are 12 tribes and sealing of 12 tribes and, and so on, so forth and so on. You, you'll, you won't be able to make sense of it, uh, the book of Revelation unless you know two things. One is it's Jewishness from verse four, chapter 4 on. And also realize those 404 verses contain over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. It sounds foreign to our ears because we haven't done our Old Testament homework. So the distinctives between Jews and the Gentiles reappear after Revelation chapter 4, and the church is, in the church is in heaven. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Now this interval that we talk about in verse 26 is also implied in other scriptures. Perhaps the most dramatic is when Jesus in Luke 4 reads in the synagogue at Nazareth from Isaiah 61 verse 1 and 2. He opens that portion, he reads that portion, he stops at a comma, closes the book, and declares this as his mandate, that it's, it, it, these things are fulfilled in your ears. I was going to preach the gospel to the poor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you read Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, and you read the rendering of it in Luke chapter 4, you'll see it's pretty much the same, except Jesus does a very strange thing. He stops at a comma, closes the book, and says, this day is this fulfilled in your ears. What, was, what did he leave out? After the comma came the words, and the day of vengeance of our God. Is that going to be fulfilled? Absolutely. Has it been fulfilled yet? No. That comma has lasted 2,000 years. And so we need to understand this interval is implied there, same interval. In Revelation 12, in fact, I've given you a partial list in your notes. I can tell you, frankly, you can find 24 in the Word of God intervals, this interval of the church implied. Now, it's hidden in the Old Testament, but it's hinted at by the, the, uh, om what's omitted in these intervals. And that leads, that links, of course, to the 24 elders and all that. But the interval is defined in Luke 19.42. These things are hid from thine eyes until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That's when you compare Luke 19.42 with Romans 11.25. And uh, the interval that we're talking about is the church. And that's an era that was kept secret in the Old Testament. In Matthew 13, Jesus says so in verses 33, 34, and 35. As he talks about the seven kingdom parables, he says, these things, I'm going to show you things that are hidden since the foundation of the world. That means the things he's expressing in Matthew 13 are not in the Old Testament. What are they? It turns out to be the church. Three reveals his greatest honor that it was his privilege to reveal this that was hidden from the Old Testament. And it's not the fact that Gentiles can be saved. They were saved before John the Baptist. No, what he's talking about here is this strange mystery that we call the church. It was hidden in the Old Testament. It's hinted at in places, but it was Paul's privilege to reveal that in Ephesians 3, verses 5, 9, and so forth. The church was born at Pentecost, and of course will be... Uh, and, and the church also had some prerequisites the atonement had to come first from Matthew 16. The resurrection had to occur first. That's in Ephesians 1. And the ascension had to take place as Ephesians 4, verses 7 through. Ephesians is your primary epistle on this whole background. The spiritual gifts occurred only after the ascension. And, of course, the giving of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. What we're talking about here is ecclesiology. You know, people... All kinds of people get all concerned, does the church go through the tribulation? There's a big debate among scholars. That's not a problem of eschatology. It's a problem of ecclesiology. Anyone that thinks the church goes through the tribulation has two pieces of homework to do. He's got to, they've got to find out what is the tribulation, what's it for, what's its purpose, what's all, that all about. They also need to find out what is the church. We're not talking about buildings like we use the term church. We're talking about the mystery church, the body of Christ. It's mystery character. It's a body concept from Ephesians 3. The church is indwelling every believer. That blew Paul's mind. He knew what the Holy Spirit was. He knew his Old Testament under Gamaliel and all the rest. What he couldn't grant, I mean, it blew his mind, that the Holy Spirit to the church is given as an indwelling commitment. That's, that's unique to the church. That wasn't true before the church. It won't be true after the church. It's the special gift of the church. The bride of Christ, Ephesians 5. And, of course, the harpazo, the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15 and so on. The fact that it's one new man, Ephesians 2. In fact, I think it was G.H. Pember that first recognized in Revelation 12 where it speaks of the woman giving birth to the man-child 
and the man-child was caught up to God in his throne. Most of us visualize that as the ascension. And G.S. Pember said it could be, but it might also include in that concept maybe the rapture, because the next thing is the tribulation goes on. Very interesting. The other thing, the church is distinguished from both the Jews and the Gentiles, 1 Corinthians 10.32 being an example of that. And that distinction evaporates in, Ephesians, in uh, Revelation 4 and following. So, by the way, if we look at the, uh, the uh, timeline that we use and learn the Bible in 24 hours, from the creation to Christ and so forth, the, the nation of Israel, of course, goes in the diaspora, the period we're in, and uh, uh, then uh, the church is, a, uh, a, is this interval that we're talking about that was hidden from the Old Testament, and then the, as Israel is restored, we're getting ready now for the big climax, the big finish. Now, you remember in Luke 19.42, Jesus said, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes. I pointed that out to you back there. Now they are hid from their eyes. This is, he, G, Jesus is declaring corporate blindness on the part of Israel. And how are, forever? No. Paul tells us in Romans 11.25, he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And the word until, you know, there are three major untils that stand in the way of the restoration of Israel. And this is one of them. Until the fullness of the Gentiles. Don't confuse the fullness of the Gentiles with the times of the Gentiles. Luke 21 uses the term times of Gentiles to portray that period from Nebuchadnezzar to the Antichrist, that era of Gentile dominion on the planet Earth. It had a beginning, it'll have an end. No, the fullness of the Gentiles is something else. It, it's, it's a church phrase. There is a number when it's complete that God will say to the, the Father will say to the Son, "Go get them." And when they come in, that starts the the that's the end of the interval, and God will once again continue His program for Israel. And so we have, of course, the fullness of the Gentiles being synonymous, if you will, with the church period. And uh, and it follows, of course, the tribulation follows that. The times of the Gentiles is from the Babylon, Babylon to the Antichrist. It's a different period altogether. And, of course, the kingdom, at the end of the tribulation, the kingdom is set up and so forth. Now, this period, but right at the end there, the 70th week consists of two halves. Three and a half years in the two, each, half, each half. Let's take a look now at the climactic verse of the 70 week prophecy. And he shall enforce the covenant. And the he is a pronoun. Who is the identity of he? Very simple grammar. What's the antecedent? The previous he was the prince that shall come. Some people try to make this the Messiah and they come up with a concept that doesn't actually fit the text, creates other problems. This is not the Messiah. The prince that shall come shall enforce the covenant with the many. That's his phrase for Israel. For one week. This is that final week. This is the 70th week of Daniel. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even till the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So what on earth is all this about? First of all, understand that he, the prince that shall come, is the bad guy, the coming prince. He apparently will enforce the covenant. Some people would translate that, he signs a treaty. It doesn't say that. It's actually he enforces a covenant. So it might be, he might make a treaty, or he may simply be enforcing the Palestinian covenant, that is, giving Israel the right to the land. It could be that simple. He promises to do that for a seven-year period. That's the, that, what defines the 70th week is the period of the enforcement of this covenant, or the, the confirming of that covenant. Enforce or confirm, same equivalent phrase. But in the middle of that seven-year period, he by then is so powerful, he ignores his commitment, and he causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Sacrifice and the oblation implies, obviously, that there is a temple standing, and they have returned to dedicate that temple and reestablish the animal sacrifices. And what's implied here is it may not be the subject of that treaty, but as a, at least a byproduct of it, that they are allowed to uh, sacrifice, go back to the uh, Levitical system. See, the great dilemma of the Jew today is he has no remedy for sin. 
Leviticus says, by the, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Where can they shed blood? They do not have a temple. They do, they do, not, have, they do not have the opportunity to, to remedy their sin. And yet they have a tremendous consciousness of sin. So they're in a real dilemma. That's what caused at the Council of Yamnia, to, this whole Judaism got, in a sense, redefined to what we would call Talmudic Judaism, which is a far cry from Mosaic Judaism. And they, the dilemma they face is they have no temple. How can they, how can they practice the, 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 book, the, the, the law in, the true, in, its, in its real sense. One of the dreams is to get the temple back and to reestablish this, and apparently they are able to do this, uh, maybe in part because of this covenant, but in any case, by the middle of this covenant, this guy, this leader, uh, causes the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So it's a repeat, if you will, of the circumstance of Antiochus Epiphanes of 167 B.C., where he not only destroyed all the Torah, he, put, he, allowed, he, he, he slaughtered pigs on the, gold, on the holy altar, but he also erected an idol in the Holy of Holies, and that was called the Abomination of Desolation, and that's what triggered the Maccabean Revolt, which led to the Hasmoneans and all that. It took them three years and so forth. Well, what's interesting here, Jesus, to his disciples in that, in that original briefing, makes reference to the Abomination of Desolation, but that's a historical thing that happened Three, uh, two centuries earlier, but he's speaking of it prophetically. What is he talking about? A repeat of that kind of an event. It's never happened. It's interesting when you study this, under Emperor Caligula, he ordered from Rome that his image be established in the Holy of Holies. This is about 140-something uh, uh, A.D. Petronius, the general in charge in those days, this is after Pilate and all this, this is later, obviously, century after the crucifixion, um, knew that if he tried to do that, there would be a, another, there would be an uprising. So he refused to follow his orders. When Caligula finds out that he didn't do it, he sends an order for Petronius to be killed. But, by, but, but then Caligula dies within two weeks, and by a mix-up of messages at sea, the message of Caligula's death arrives in Judea before the order to have Petronius killed. So he gets off the hook. And, uh, but what's interesting here is to see God intervene. Because then the shortly thereafter, the temple is destroyed. And the, this, the, the, this, the temple was destroyed under warfare conditions. They didn't erect any altars and worship them. They were fighting for their lives, both sides. And so the temple is destroyed. Now there can't be that. that in order to have an abomination of desolation, you've got to have the temple standing. That, we know the temple will be rebuilt because Paul, John, and Jesus all make reference to it standing at the end times. Anyway, and Daniel does too, I guess. Well, I should say four. Okay, um, let's keep going here. Which prince? The antecedent of the princes shall come. It's required by grammar. You also, something else that's kind of interesting, if you study the imperial succession after Nero, General Galba uh, accedes to the throne, but he's assassinated. Ortho is unfit, and he committed suicide. General Vespasian, the father of Titus Vespasian, Titus Vespasian was the captain in charge of the siege in 70 AD, but his father is called to, uh, fit the, to, to uh, uh, fulfill the vacancy. So Titus himself, even though he's the commander of the uh, Roman legions under the fall of Jerusalem, he is a prince. He is the heir to his father is sitting on the, on the, uh, the emperor of Vespasian. You follow me? And by the way, another small point, there are some authorities that believe that Titus could have been a descendant of Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes was, of course, a Syrian Greek. But when, when the, as, as the Roman Empire starts to take succession over the Greeks, many of the royal families intermarry. And there are some that speculate that Titus may have been a descendant. He, he could claim descendancy from Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, don't know if that's true. It wouldn't surprise me, though, if the Antichrist, when he does show up, will have some surprising credentials because he's going to pass himself off in pretty sterling terms to the whole world. We also incur this time, times, and the dividing of time. Times, remember we talked about that's a dual, uh, not a, so time is singular, times is a dual, and half a time, it's a way of saying three and a half, and uh, that will occur in, uh, in Daniel 12. It occurred in Daniel 7, it'll occur in Daniel 12 again. But here in Daniel 27, we have the midst of the week, the three and a half years. And uh, it's also called 42 months twice in Revelation 12 and 13. And it's also called in Revelation and in Daniel 12 when we get there, uh, 1260 days. The main point is, 
each half of the seven year period is called half of a week, called three and a half years, time times the dividing of time, uh, 42 months, 1260, those are all equivalent phrases. The Holy Spirit, this is probably, in fact, unquestionably, this is the most documented period of time in the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. These references are in Old and New Testament together. This peculiar seven year period, the last half of which is the um, great tribulation is there um, in the midst of the week, day 27 and so forth. So let's talk a little about this abomination of desolation. You know, it's interesting. In John chapter 10, verse 22, right in the middle of a discourse, John happens to mention it was in Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. This is one of those little tidbits. If you're reading, you just skip over. Don't get, don't, don't get stumbled on this. But if you double back and you say, wait a minute, how can it be the Feast of Dedication in winter? That doesn't work. Which Feast of Dedication? Solomon's Temple? From 1 Kings 8, that was in the autumn, not the winter. Well, what about Zerubbabel, the second temple, as we call it? Zerubbabel's temple. That was in the spring, according to Ephesians 6. Uh, excuse me, uh, Ezra 6. And uh, the rededication is in winter on the 25th of Kislev, and what this is is Hanukkah. It shocks many Christians to realize that Hanukkah is endorsed by the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 22. Why did the Holy Spirit call our attention to the... See, the Hanukkah is not a feast of Moses. It's not in the Old Testament, in the usual sense. It celebrates an event that occurred, what was we say, between the Testaments, in 167 B.C. But it's interesting because it's what the Holy Spirit's saying, we need to understand the events surrounding Antiochus Epiphanes because it leads to an event that Jesus will idiomatically refer to as happening in the future. And so as we go to this period and look at this area, we have the Septuagint right in the middle of the Greek period, and we have this strange period under Antiochus Epiphanes, which is, again, two centuries before Christ's use of that phrase. So we, we are dependent upon the history of Antiochus Epiphanes to understand what that really involved. And so we went through all this in our previous chapter when we studied that, but he made the Torah reading punishable by death. He slaughtered a sow on the altar. He erected an idol to Zeus on the Holy of Holies, which is defined as the abomination of desolation. And that led, of course, to the Maccabean Revolt. It took three years to throw off the Syrian uh, Empire, or the Syrian uh, Greeks, the uh, Seleucid Empire. And he rededicated, and by the way, the, the uh, idol of Zeus was done on Antiochus Epiphanes' birthday. And it was on his birthday then, three years later, they, they succeeded throwing off the yoke. They destroyed all the, all the implements that were contaminated or desecrated by the Greeks. And they rebuilt those and, and rededicated the temple. And that rededication is celebrated as Hanukkah. Don't confuse the historical commemorative aspect of it with the legends, the colorful legends that surround it, uh, be that as it may. But now we have, now let me count this because there's a lot of confusion here. The 70th week is defined by a covenant being enforced by this world leader. In the middle of that week, in the middle of that seven-year period, we, he erects this uh, uh, image uh, to be worshipped in the Holy of Holies. And that's, that's, when that occurs, that's when Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, then let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. And, uh, and he, for then will be the great tribulation. That great, that phrase, notice the great tribulation is not seven years, it's the last half of that seven year period. The last three and a half years. How do I know? Jesus said so. He labels it that, and he's quoting from Daniel chapter 12. The two halves of that week are called three and a half years, 42 months, 1260. Every, Holy Spirit did everything but put it in nanoseconds for you. So, and... Uh, for then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. By way of remembrance here. He is, Jesus is quoting, in effect, from Daniel chapter 12. Because it speaks of a time, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So this is what Jesus is quoting from when he says, a time of trouble which is unprecedented. That's a terrifying thing to embrace. Because certainly the Jews have suffered idiomatically, more than just the Holocaust in, in Europe, but that's certainly idi emblematic 
of, of, of terrible, terrible abuse. One Jew in three on the planet Earth was killed during the Nazi Holocaust. But Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9 speak of this period and says two out of three will suffer death in this period. Terrible. The time of Jacob's trouble is the idiom that Jeremiah uses in his verse. We speak of the Great Tribulation because Jesus call, labels it that way from Daniel 12. Jeremiah speaks of this period, calls that the time of Jacob's trouble. That helps us to realize, yes, it's tribulation worldwide, but its primary focus is the Jew. There's a very key verse in Hosea 5.15. It's the last verse of Hosea 5. He says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. Some of your Bibles may say early, but that's a mistranslation. I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. That's singular and specific. God is speaking here. I will go and return to my place. How can he return if he hasn't left it? No, he's left it. He's returning to his place till they acknowledge their offense, seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's, he, has returned, uh, he has returned to his place during this period of time, but he will come back when? When they acknowledge their offense. There is a prerequisite condition to the second coming of Christ. There's several, actually. One of which is for Israel to petition him to come back. To acknowledge them and, and in, a, in a corporate sense, and uh, he will then return. The prince that shall come. This is one of the titles of the seed of the serpent in Genesis 3:15, when God declares war on uh, on uh, Satan. He speaks of the seed of the woman, the title of Christ, and a seed of the serpent. And it's in Genesis 3:15. The idle shepherd. We'll look at that in a minute. Zechariah 11, 16, and 17. The little horn of Daniel 7. The little horn of Daniel 8. These are all allusions in various ways. The prince that shall come in Daniel 9.26. The willful king in Daniel 11. We, we'll see when we get there. The New Testament, I'm just, those are selections from 33 titles in the Old Testament. Here's a selection from 13 of the New. He's called the beast in Revelation 11 and 13. The false prophet in Revelation 13. The Antichrist or Pseudochrist in 1 John 2. It's interesting, the Antichrist, it's interesting, John who wrote Revelation does not use the word Antichrist to describe his world leader. We infer that from, from some other passages, but... He uses different terms. The lawless one in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The man of sin in 2 Thessalonians 2. The one who comes in his own name. Jesus alludes to him in John 5 verse 43. The son of perdition, 2 Thessalonians 2. These are all some of the, from 13. He's an intellectual genius, obviously. He's a persuasive orator. He's a very shrewd politician. He's a financial genius. He's not a military leader. He becomes militarily very powerful. But he, he rises to power on politics and peacemaking. He ends up becoming a very forceful military leader, very powerful organizer, and he's also a unifying religious guru. And there's lots. You can make a whole study of this. These are just some highlights. Is he a Jew or a Gentile? Big question. The leader will be the son of Satan. That's clear. Some believe the, Jew, the leader will be a Jew for a number of passages. Uh, John 5.43, you know, another will come in his own name. The word is alos, not heteros in the Greek, which implies that he's a Jew, not a Gentile. And he obviously is received by Israel, which implies that he's Jewish. He's received as Messiah. Some believe he will be a Gentile because he's a Roman prince, right? And there's other reasons too. Well, before you get into that debate with anybody, you realize there's two players. It's a duet. It's not a single guy. Revelation 13 has two players a political leader and a religious leader that operate in, as a duet. They often call, scholars often call this a satanic trinity. Satan's object is to be worshipped. He's got his prototype like a son, and he's got his prototype like the Holy Spirit. So it's like a trinity is the, is the conception of some scholars. The first beast of two in Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, which is typically a Gentile idiom here, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. Those sound familiar from Daniel? Interesting, isn't it? Except they're backwards, aren't they? 
They're backwards because we're looking backward in time, not forward. But anyway, and the dragon gave him his power. Who's the dragon? Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 had identified him. If you've gotten here, you would, it's the red dragon is none other than Satan, of course. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And Satan can give him authority because these are this is his world. Remember when Christ was tempted, the three temptations. Satan said to Christ, showed him all the nations of the world, these are mine to give, whoever I will, if you'll give them to you, if you just worship me. Jesus didn't challenge his ownership. Interesting. He purchased, he purchased, he did, Satan's a usurper. He purchased that in Revelation 5 is the most important escrow closing in the universe. Anyway, continuing Revelation 13, 3. Just, we won't go through the whole thing, just a few verses here. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to the death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Did he really die, or did everybody think he died? doesn't matter, because whatever it was, it was healed somehow, and all the world wondered after the beast. There's only one physical description of this person in the Bible that I know of, and that's in Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. It says, woe to the idol, that's I-D-O-L, not idol like lazy, but idol like a false worship. Woe to the idol shepherd that leaveth the flock. Wow. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. That's all we know. Some people speculate that this, the, the, the incapacitated arm and eye is a result of a head wound. So he, they thought he was dead, but he comes back to life somehow. And, but he's got an impairment. And some people speculate because of that impairment, as people seek to identify themselves with him, they take his sign on their forehead or on their hand because those are identifying impairments of him. Sort of like if you're trying to, uh, uh, to identify with Moshe Dayan, you wear an eye patch or true grit, or whatever. You know, in other words, you, you adopt a, an idiom of, of the, word, the person you're, fo uh, you're following. So that's a, a suspect on that. Now we've got a second beast rises up. I beheld another beast rising up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb. Now he said authority like the lamb, but he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and ca causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. You need to be sensitive. The book of Revelation has certain terms, of uh, uh, precision terms. Earth dwellers aren't, ju aren't just people that physically are on the earth. They are the people that dwell on the earth. They're the losers. First beast before causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. There's that identity thing again on the wound. And deceiveth all them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the first beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Notice how many times this head wound is alluded to, three times here in the passage so far, as an identity thing with him somehow. Had the had wound by the sword and did live. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had a mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred three score and six. People who know nothing else about the Bible all know about the 666. And this is where it comes from, verse 18 of chapter 13. And that leads to all kinds of conjectures. Now, the 666, the word Christos in the Greek consists of two letters that start and end that word. And you put a, a serpent between these two, and you get in the Greek gematria 600 plus 60 plus 6, or the 600, uh, 666 derives from the numerical value of, the, of those three letters and, uh, and are so rendered. But uh, that, that, of course, is the Antichrist, the type of the Antichrist. So you take the first and last letters and put the serpent in the middle of it, and you get the Antichrist. But whose number? You know, you find books 
spending all their time on barcodes, you know, uh, that, that, because the barcodes use a six as a separator symbol in some of the, in some of the not all, but some of them. Uh, there are insertable chips that, uh, for, uh, you know, where you can take a tiny thing and insert it in a, in a, in, under the skin and, and have it transpond information and so forth. There are all these technologies which indeed can be useful in protecting a person's identity, to avoid identity theft, and that's becoming an increasingly, uh, increasing concern in our modern culture. But that's not what it's talking about. Clearly, these technologies permit a dictator incredible power. That's not the point. They overlook that it is his number, not ours, that's the issue. It's not your PIN number or whatever, or social security number, that's the issue. It's his number that you take visibly as a sign of allegiance to him. Now, you may need to do that in order to get a, a, a identity that you need. I realize his control. That's going to be very effective. But the point is, it's his number and name that is the critical identity. So take whatever credit cards you've got or whatever other things. That's not the issue. But if you pledge allegiance to this leader by taking on his identity on your forehead or your arm, that is a absolute barrier to ever being saved. You've picked your, you've picked your choice. Well, we know in God's time, please, it's getting close to the end. I thought I would show you something kind of interesting. I think I'm indebted to uh, Clarence Larkin for first observing this. It's interesting that if you take the segments of Israel's uh, um, history, that if you take the literal period on the calendar, say from the promise to Abraham to the Exodus, it turns out to be 75, so it's 430 years, that's 505, 505 years, but during that 505, if you subtract the, the, the years that don't count, namely the ones in which Ishmael had suzerainty, which was 15, you get 490 years. You say, well, okay, so what, what's that got to do with anything? Well, if you go from the Exodus to the temple, it, it, it was begun in 1 Kings 6, uh, verse 8, and it's completed in, uh, uh, anyway, uh, so you got uh, uh, 594 years plus 7, so you get 601. But from that calendar time of 601 years, you subtract the years under the judges when they were under sub, uh, uh, sub, uh, servitude. And there were uh, six of those, under Mesopotamia for eight years, under Moabites for 18 years, Canaanites for 20 years, Midianites 7, Ammonites 18, Philistines 40. You add that up, that's 111 years of servitude. When you take the 601 years on the calendar and pull out the 111 that they're in servitude, you get 490 again. You always take the calendar, take what, when Israel's out of favor, and what you got left is 490 years. From the temple to the Edict of Artaxerxes, temple was 1005 B.C., Nehemiah 2.1 was 445 B.C., as we noted earlier. That's 560 years. But you subtract that out of that 560, the 70 years of Babylonian captivity, you again get 490 years. Now, when you see all this, you see, you remember in the New Testament when they asked Jesus, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Seven times? What did he say? 70 times 7. You and I assume that's a figure of speech, and indeed, indeed it is. But it's also the period of time that God forgave Israel. 490 years, then you owe me 70, remember? From Artaxerxes to the first advent, that was the 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy, call it 483 years. Then we have a church interval that we don't know how long it is. But whatever it is, the 69 weeks plus the seventh week is 490 years, there's an interval in there again where Israel set aside the church. In this case, they're going to be subtracting something like 2,000 years, some number like that probably. So that's kind of interesting, 70 times 7. Israel, this is the, the, what we've just studied is the fourth of 490-year intervals in the history of Israel. One of the big debates, of course, is where is the... Uh, how does the tribulation fit into all this? We know there's a 70th week that's defined by the Antichrist, that he co he defined by his enforcing a covenant. In the middle of that, he ex 
he erects the abomination of desolation, which is the trigger for the Jews to flee as Jerusalem. From there to the end is great tribulation, which ends, of course, is interrupted by the battle of Armageddon, where Jesus intercedes, his second coming, he sets up the millennium. The question is, where does the rapture take place? There are those that believe the rapture, the rapture of the church takes place at the end, that we, the church goes through the tribulation. People who believe that, first of all, usually do not know anything about Daniel chapter 9, because it doesn't fit. There are some that know, realize that the church does not go through the tribulation. They recognize that the tribulation starts in the middle of the week, so people who hold that view are called mid-trib people. There are some that are, it's a variation of that called pre-wrath, he uses that term, but uh, Rosenthal has published that popular book in that area, and it's basically a variation of the mid-trib position. And of course, as you probably gathered, most of us uh, hold the view, doesn't mean we're right, but we hold the view that the rapture takes place prior to, the, not only the, before the tribulation, before the 70th week of Daniel. And in fact, I want you to notice that it doesn't occur at the beginning of the 70th week, there's an interval, we don't know how long, between the rapture and the beginning of the 70th week. What happens in that interval? The Antichrist can't show up until the rapture takes place. When the Antichrist is revealed, there's an interval of time. It might be one day, it might be 30 years for him to rise to power where he can enforce this covenant. So there's an interval of some kind there. Now, the post-trib people, that's the, I'd say many of the denominational churches, have some problems. First of all, they deny the teaching, the New Testament teaching of eminency. All through the New Testament, we're taught to expect him at any moment. That's called eminency. He could come before this meeting's over. He'd come tomorrow morning. We are told to expect him at any moment. That's a doctrine of eminency. If, you're, if you believe that the rapture doesn't take place till at the end of the tribulation, you've got all kinds of things that have to happen before he can, he can gather us. Not, that's contrary to scripture. It also, the post-trib view requires the church to be on the earth during the 70th week. Israel and the church are mutually exclusive. Don't take my word for it. Do your own study. But I think you'll discover, if you're, if you're diligent, that Israel and the church are dealt with separately. According to post-trib, the church experienced God's wrath. We were promised several places not, we were promised not to experience his wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Revelation 3, 10, and other, other passages. And how can the bride come with him if he's coming to gather him? I mean, there are contradictions. He comes first to gather it, comes back with the bride subsequently. There are some more problems. Who will populate the millennium? If everybody at the, at the second coming are either say, uh, given the resurrection bodies or cast into Hades, who's left to populate a millennium which has which has death, has problems, as Millennium told another study. Who are the sheep and goat judgment, of, who are in the sheep, sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25? And uh, how can the virgins of Matthew 25 buy oil without the mark of the beast? These are not big deals, but they're, they're problems. The rapture precedes the tribulation, I don't know, from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The seventh week is defined by covenant enforced by world leader. That's, that's, that's defined. The great tribulation is the last half of that week. The leader cannot be revealed until after the rapture, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and let me show you that. The order of events are dealt with. 2 Thessalonians 2 was a response to a forgery. Paul's all upset because they're circulating. The, the people in Thessalonians are now really upset because they think they've either been mistaught or they've missed the rapture. He's trying to straighten them out by reminding them what he taught them. And the day, the day of the Lord is the climax. That day shall not come except their come a falling away first. Most people view that as the apostasy, and that's fine. It actually, though, may be a reference to the rapture, but I'm not going to build this case on that. Let's, uh, let's let that go for a moment. He who now restrains, the Holy Spirit, will restrain until he be taken out of the way. So the restrainer is removed, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. In other words, the wicked one can't be revealed until the restrainer is removed. So we can get into more, but that's, there's, the, there's a whole briefing, two, two one-hour sessions with the diagrams on this very issue, the rapture, for those of you that want to get into it. But we're in the area of eschatology, and the first branch, as you'll notice, 
is amillennial, premillennial. Most churches, Protestant churches, are, and Catholic churches, are amillennial. They don't really focus on the idea of Jesus coming back to rule the planet Earth from a literal throne in Israel. Yet that's what the Bible, if you take it seriously, says. Those that are premillennial believe there is a millennium are, are, uh, believe that, that uh, God is going to do that very thing. There were some that were post-millennial, said that we're already in the millennium. Those views have pretty much died out since World War I and II and what have you. Most people recognize we are not in the millennium, or some people would say, we can't be in the if, if we're in the millennium, then Satan's chain is too long. See? So, so most preterism is a variation, very popular today, but it's also a variation of amillennialism. Reconstructionism is a, in a, for, a form of the same thing. But within the premillennial, those that take the millennium view of Christ seriously, there are really three groups, the pre-tribs, the mid-tribs, and the post-tribs. And, and so it turns out that most churches are amillennial and post-tribulational. Many denominations in the Catholic Church would be in that category. People who are regarded as biblical fundamentalists are typically premillennial and pre-tribulational. And different good people. There, by the way, there are good people in each of these camps, so don't, it's not that... It's not, that simple. It turns out it all will derive from your views of hermeneutics or your theory of interpretation. The more literally you take the Bible, the more seriously you, you treat the text, the more you're driven to the right side of this diagram, that is the premillennial pre-trib position. If you have willingness to be allegorical and to spiritualize, to treat these things as just poetry or, or to be soft in your hermeneutics, then, you can, then you'll swing to the left side of this. So you'll discover that if you know a person's hermeneutical perspective, if they're very strict, they take the Bible very seriously and very literally, you can predict that they, if, if, if they're not yet, they will drift into the uh, pre-trib camp as a, as a perspective, as a point of view, so for what it's worth. Now, the pre-trib is not a recent idea. There are people who try to sell that. It's not true. You'll find it in the Epistle of Barnabas in the first century, Irenaeus in Against Heresies, Hippolytus in the second century. Just more. In other words, perhaps most interesting, Ephraim the Syrian in the fourth century, it, they translated, they just relatively a few years ago found one of his sermons, uh, translated it, and uh, he was a very, very prominent writer in the Eastern Church, the Byzantine Church. And uh, in one of his sermons, he says, For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they should see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. It's an illusion, it's just a sample illusion. It's clearly he was teaching a pre-trib, pre-millennial viewpoint. And of course, uh, uh, the pre-tribulation eschatology shows up all through the centuries, and I won't take you through all these commentaries and so forth. It was popularized by Lucanza and Edward Irving and John Darby and Margaret MacDonald in the early 1800s. And some people allege that they invented it. That's not true. They did popularize it, but it was, it's been around since the first century. Now something else, just to highlight something, the Revelation architecture will be important to your understanding here. In Revelation, we have the lampstands that are identified in chapter 1 as the church, and they show up in chapter 2 and 3. In chapter 4, they are in heaven when John arrives, chapter 4. So the church is in heaven in chapter 4. The 24 elders are identified as the redeemed by their own songs and so forth. They worship the lamb before he receives the scroll, and it's when he opens the scroll that all these judgments start to proceed. So when these judgments proceed, where are the 24 elders in, in, in representing the church in heaven? And the tribulation begins when the scroll is unsealed. And of course, the 70th week is then detailed from chapter 6 through chapter 19 in the book of Revelation. And from here, if you want to get into that, we encourage you to take on a serious study of the book of Revelation. Another thing, the seven churches, are the, the chapters 2 and 3 are the most important chapters. We have the churches of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea that have at least four levels of understanding. They were local churches with real problems. They also carry messages that are to individual churches. They also carry messages that are homiletic to each of us as individuals, but there's a fourth level, and that's historical. If they were in any other order, what I'm about to tell you would not be true. The, the Ephesus seems to characterize the apostolic church, Smyrna, the persecuted church, Pergamus, the, mar the married church, married to the world, the medieval church of Thyatira, the denominational church of Sardis, and the missionary church of Philadelphia, and the apostate church of Laodicea. What's interesting is these first three letters have some peculiar structural characteristics. The promises that are given to them are postscripted after the conclusion of the letter in a very strange way. The last 
4, the promises are made in the body of the letter, not as a postscript. And furthermore, the last four all have explicit references to the second coming of Christ. The first three do not. So Thyatira is given the promise that they will enter the tribulation. Kind of an interesting commitment. Philadelphia is expressly told will not. It will be gathered out before the time of the tribulation. And as for the rest, they're somewhat speculative as to where they fit into the picture. But that's uh, something you can study. It's kind of a interesting, and there's a lot more to it. There's a whole study there. But you want to understand the doctrine of eminence. Eminent means the next expectation. Don't confuse that with imminent in the sense that God is not only transcendent, but he's far above us. That we're not talking about eminence in that sense. Where nor we should be em, uh, eminent in the sense of a title of honor, uh, like an outstanding distinction. It's a different word. Eminence means what's coming next. The doctrine of eminency. Believers are taught to expect the Savior from heaven at any moment. Uh, Philippians 3.20, Titus 2.13, Hebrews 9.28, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, and 5, Revelation 22.20 as examples. Eminence expresses hope and a warm spirit of expectancy, as, as uh, 1 Thessalonians emphasizes. And the doctrine of eminence is intended to result in a victorious and purified life. This pervades the whole New Testament, the doctrine of eminency. If you are mid-trib or pre-wrath or post-trib, you have to deny the doctrine of eminency because there's intervening events. Follow me? Paul seemed to include himself among those who looked for Christ's return. 1 Thessalonians 4. And... Uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2 and so forth. Timothy was admonished to keep his commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that was all, uh, that was what he taught. Jewish converts were reminded that yet a little while he shall come, that will come and not tarry in Hebrews 10 and so forth. Occupy till I come, Jesus says. The expectation of some were so strong, they stopped work and had to be exhorted to return to their jobs in 2 Thessalonians 3. And to have patience in James 5 8. They were that expectant. In other words, they overdid it in a sense, right? So there's two extremes in our horizon. One is what I call rapturitis. <laughs> These are people that are so sure the rapture is a week from Tuesday, they don't send their kids to college, they don't plan for the future, they don't provide for their family. You know, that's, they're so, you know, some people say they're so heavenly minded, there's no earthly good. Well, that's, that's more than that. They, they're, they're so preoccupied with the rapture. They're guilty of what some of the post-trib types accuses of, that we don't participate in elections, we don't get behind issues before our community, because we're, we're going to get ruptured out of here next year, why do we bother? You know, wrong attitude. Occupy till I come, Jesus says. And that goes to the other extreme in the rapture mania. These are the date setters. These are the date setters. And uh, every, I, I, I hardly a week goes by that I don't get a paper from some guy who's got some new calculation with the signs in the stars and the most popular shirt sizes or whatever. Uh, uh. <laughs> so these are, see, if you're going to have, do, deny the doctrine of eminency, uh, uh, I mean, if you take post and pre-wrath or mid-trip positions, you're imposing intercedent conditions that have to occur before Christ can come back. Donald Gray Barnhouse used to needle Walter Martin every time he came to the office. He used to, and Walter used to laugh about it because he, Walter, Donald Gray Barnhouse came into the office and said, sad day, sad day, Jesus can't come back today. And that was just his way of needling the post-trip types, which, which of course, uh, 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 that uh, Walter was, you know, he, he was, in those days he was post-trip. He's pre-trip now, I think, but anyway, so. <laughs> Rapturitis is probably a uniquely American dementia. It's uniquely here in this country. Just because we think we can prove that the church will not go through the great tribulation, I think we can. Why? Where do we get the arrogance to assume that we will escape what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the past 2,000 years have had to endure? It's called persecution. Don't confuse tribulation in the general sense with the, that specific period of time for th three and a half years labeled the Great Tribulation. Just because we know we won't go through the Great Tribulation doesn't mean that there might not be really dark days ahead for us here in America. There are many experts 
that really believe the body of Christ in America is going to have to go underground. It's getting increasingly politically incorrect to be a biblical Christian in this country. And J. Vernon McGee caught my attention many years ago when he predicted not only will the body of Christ have to go underground, the attack against them will be led by the denominational churches. What a shocker. He said that 20 years ago. And uh, be, I, I think I'd be... Let's remember what Jesus said. Therefore be ye also ready for in such an hour as ye think not. The Son of Man cometh. And by the way that's phrased, he means on the short side. It doesn't mean it's going to take longer than you think. It's going to be sooner than you probably think. Now, there are some circumstances that cause us to believe that things are we're moving into that. I, I believe you and I are being plunged into that period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time Jesus was among us, walking the shores of Galilee and climbing the mountains of Judea. On the one hand. On the other hand, there are some circumstances that are going to take a little while. There are some things that the furniture is being moved into the final act, but it's not quite ready yet. There are certain allies not in position. There are certain cities that need, there's, there's certain things that we can look for. To the extent it looks like we've got some time, we should rejoice. Because we've got an opportunity to improve our report cards. We've got an opportunity. How many of you know someone that you love that has yet to discover the body of Christ, uh, the, the redemption that God has given us through Christ? Have you noticed that your attempts to witness are counterproductive? The closer they are, the more resistant they would be to anything you might offer. Every one of us in this room that is, are uh, 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 beneficiaries of the redemption of Christ are the result of someone's prayer. And so you've got an opportunity to pray these people in. And every day that goes by gives God an opportunity to bring into their path those influences, those insights, that might blindfold their prejudices and cause them to discover the extremes that God has gone to that they might live, that they might have fellowship with him throughout eternity. We want to take that very, very seriously. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer. And let's bow our hearts. Father, we praise you that you've gone to such extremes on our, to our benefit. We thank you for these precious passages in Daniel. We do ask, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would guide us, keep us from error, and keep us focused on what you would have us focus on. But, Father, we do thank you that you've seen fit to lay out before the foundation of the world a program of redemption, not only for Israel, but ourselves personally. We thank you that you love us so much as to provide an eternal fellowship that's available to us for the asking. Oh, Father, we do ask. And we ask, Father, that you would indeed, through your Holy Spirit, help each of us to understand more clearly just what it is, specifically, that you would have of each of us in the days that remain. As we recognize the days of the consummation are ever closer than they ever were, that much of what the Scripture talks about is on our near horizon. Help us, Father, to be more effective stewards of the opportunities that are in front of us. We ask that, Father, that we might be more fruitful stewards and that we might be more pleasing in thy sight. As we, this night, without any reservation, commit ourselves into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Mashiach Nagid, our Redeemer and Lord and King, in whose name we do pray. Amen.